Welcome to Conversations at Studios, Inc. My name is Courtney Wasson, and I'm the Executive Director of Studios, Inc. Today, we'll be talking with artist Miguel Rivera, who is in his third year of his residency and opening an exhibition this Friday, September 13th from 6 to 9 p.m. titled Geo Matrix. Studios Inc. is Kansas City's arts nonprofit that offers pivotal three year residencies to mid career artists. Thank you for joining us. Okay. Hi, Miguel. Hi, I'm, Courtney. I'm so glad you get to join me at the desk for our first Studios Inc. conversation. Well, thanks for the invitation. This is a great idea. Well, thank you. Um, so we're going to start talking about you and your work um, and share it with our audience at Studios, Inc. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you is how much of the printmaking process inspires your work? I would say it's, it's the main driver, but uh, it's, uh, at the end of the, every piece, it's about one third. Mm -hmm. But what drives, what it kind of drives my work evolving printmaking is how uh, as a printmaker, I, I can think in layers, I can think in colors, I can think of an image is deconstructed in three or four phases and it keeps morphing. And that only happens in printmaking for me. Well, so when you say an image is deconstructed, so you like starting with a complete image and manipulating it and deconstructing it. It's a general, yeah, vague idea. I have a, I have a sketch that I mm -hmm. digitize, mm -hmm. Photoshop and take it to the lasers, but that's the beginning process because after that I go back and start to layer up and print more matrices, or more plates, one on top of the other, and then go back with the final plate and then kind of compress everything. So it's, it's the process is kind of self-evident um, because, you know, you can see all the multiple layers and transparencies. So it's it's not only one image, but it's a compilation of uh, sometimes even 12 images. And I think that perspective is unique to you as a printmaker who thinks in layers and bringing the layers into it. You also, or let me back up, when we think about printmaking, sometimes we generally think in traditional means of printmaking, so copper plates, or screen printing, etchings, um, you know, woodcuts, but you just spoke of lasers. Right, I, and I think that uh, that's the traditional part, which is you know still honor and revere and taught at many schools, including ours. But the reason that I came to KCAI at the printmaking department is the liberal, you know, view on how we can approach the medium without making editions. Mm -hmm. So we're using the pre-making tools to make one of a kind, which, you know, in my department, with the support of my colleagues, is something that is really welcome and appreciated by students. Does that align printmaking more with painting then? It could be, you know, um, paintings, uh, when you look at Jasper Jones, Rauschenberg, who happen to be making prints too, in their uh, timeline, they can see how every day they would paint and then the next day they would change their mind. And the difference was, uh, with pre-making, they always erase images and they would recreate the image and forth, so forth. In my case, I keep tweaking it, I keep changing. I, and sometimes my images, my original vague idea, has changed dr drastically, but I don't like to deny the, the the beginning process or the beginning layer. Well, and we should explain. So, in printmaking, traditionally, you the goal is to have a final image that you can create multiples of. Right, right, traditionally, right. right. Like even the you know in the Edo period and Mokuhanga Japanese woodblock, and then we can think of. Hokusai, that uh, you know, we have a master plate, mm -hmm. and he knew exactly how to separate the scholars, carve each block individually, and then combine them. So there is a planning process, and it's very straightforward with uh, publishing companies or shops. So they have this methodology that you have to present the sketch or the painting, and the master printer with the artist, they 
separate the whole thing and recreate that painting. So in that case, in, the, in that traditional mode, printmaking has been a surrogate to other media. And in my case, and you know, with Laura and Hugh and other people throughout the school, we look at the other way. I would actually like to use the joke, I would actually like to paint the way I print. So my paintings are mimicking my prints. That's what I that's what I enjoy about your work too, because it's not when you walk up to a piece you're not gonna see the one of ten or one of three hundred. It's the one. It's a unique art object and it and it seems as though it allows you to play more and and not know when it's done where as you were speaking of Japanese printmakers they start from knowing where it's done and then going through the process um, so I, I really enjoy that and I think it was important to set that as our foundation for our talk because some people who are listening to this are not printmakers like yourself or my his background is printmaking too and so it orients them when did you first discover printmaking as an artist? As, as the age of seven. Seven? Seven. I was seven when um, back in my hometown in Mexico, I, my brother took me to back then an associate's degree in printmaking at the University of Guanajuato. They had a children's program, an outreach program. And they probably noticed that I have some inclination, some ability to draw. And that was the only program that they had for children. So printmaking was something that it came as a natural venue that they have available. Mm -hmm. Then I ventured out into other media, went to high school, and then eventually came back to the real program, so to speak, the three-year program in printmaking. And also printmaking, that was the only option that they have at that, at that level at the three-year oh. period. So that was, the, that was the foundation program. For three years, you uh, learn different processes, different techniques. Uh, it's divided by media or medium. Um, and then uh, painting, graphic design, photo, they came as elective courses. But the main focus was print. Why did they prioritize printmaking, do you think? Because the uh, Jesus Gallardo, the founder of the of the school, back in, I believe, 1952, that's all he knew. He had a strong mm -hmm. foundation in, um, in printmaking, but mostly painting. However, he thought that if you knew how to print, it would be easier to learn how to paint because, you know, you have to plan your drawing, you have to research, you know, do props, and learn about rendering, values, form, contour line. And once you dissect your images that way, then painting becomes about, you know, adding color to everything in his mind. So you mentioned research and the work that you do when you first see it in Geomatrix and his historically from my understanding of your work is very geometric and very abstract. And, but there's a lot of research in your work. There's, right. a, there's a lot of, there's a wealth of information and personal associations that one who maybe steps to a piece would know about initially. Can you speak to some of that? Sure. Yeah, as a counterpoint, uh, people think that my, you know, work is capricious. It's about taste and style. But um, what I've done is basically look at maps as foundations, like inspiration points. And then once I get the maps, usually historical maps, uh, I've been reading about the history of the Americas and the conquerors and all the routes that they took to get to this continent. Mm -hmm. and so I draw lines on the maps that they used. And then uh, through the magic of Photoshop, I just remove those lines and I use them as a baseline to to compositions. Okay. So that's one. And then I also, the multiple layers that I was talking about, sometimes it's the actual map, sometimes it's the image of, of something that is a sideline information to the map. Like, if, for example, the structure of a virus, mapping the virus, or my, mapping the human body sometimes, or mapping the route from Guanajuato to Kansas City, or mapping lately the route of water between 
um, the Oregon Trail. Mm -hmm. So that's that's one of the pieces in, in the show. I also liked how in one of our previous discussions, you talked about maps as subjective, and we accept them as fact. as dogma, as dogma, yeah, yeah, as belief that this is this is the way this is. That there's a, there's an inherent trust that we place in the maps that are made, and we don't question the map maker. Exactly. Well, the and reading about um, the history of you know the the Americas, Columbus wasn't a map maker. He actually bought a map from an Italian uh, cartographer. So what they thought it was going to be, uh, you know, India, the West Indies, and they ended up in the Caribbean Sea. But that, that's what, what is striking to me, according to Charles Mann, one of the books that I read, is the whoever holds the matrix, the power, you know, can write history. Mm -hmm. or rewrite it. So when you look at uh, maps from National Geographic to economic maps, they can make one country look bigger or more powerful, the colors that they use. Uh, it's also interesting to me when I travel to uh, Japan, I, I was amazed in China. They have maps, uh, geomaps, in which you know, their countries are the center, epicenter of the world. Look at uh, you know the U.S. You know we're the epicenter right now. Mm -hmm. So everything your perception of the the globe changes according to the area. So in that in that sense, you know our sense of you know the place of the U.S. and throughout the world, it's very local. But when you look abroad, it changes. It changes mm -hmm. considerably the way. Uh, and that you know uh, maps are power. So would they're deemed to be manipulated. Well, and I thought that that was interesting. You referred to maps as a matrix of power. And as a printmaker, we manipulate matrix different, whether it's a copper plate or a mesh screen or now lasers yeah. and, and the computer. And, um, and so we've talked a little bit about the geometry aspect of this source of inspiration being a traveled route, perhaps, that you connect the dots essentially yeah. and sometimes you even just put dots on your on I your do, pieces yeah. then um thinking about overlaying the, this idea of matrix and playing with it and to say that there's a matrix of power that can be manipulated even through imagery is an interesting subject to explore and on the you take it even further or you will take it even further with your collaboration with Dwight Frizzell and this idea of sound and how Dwight can map sound based off of artwork that you've made or, or inspiration that you've placed in your artwork, such as the Oregon Trail. Why did you choose to incorporate that? Basically, it was something that uh, one of my friends, uh, Jonathan Kamnitzer, mm -hmm. he really liked one of the pieces. And I never do commission work. Mm -hmm. And then the only compromise that I've thought of is, can we find something that he can relate to and mm -hmm. I can relate to? Being in Oregon uh, in my undergrad years and living there and then constantly, I still have, I have family there. And then living in Kansas City, the natural flow for me was the Oregon Trail going in reverse. You know, I end up mapping from Walla Walla, Washington, all the way down to the Westport. Oh, so okay. it was it was a it's a very intended consequence to use that specific map to kind of you know make some previous piece that I had made uh fit my current dialogue mm -hmm. still using the map. Mm -hmm. Uh something that attracted Dwight to the project was how I'm thinking about the flow of water, you know, the to him is is very uh inspirational to think for him water carries life but also in this time sometimes carry diseases mm. so we were talking about the history of viruses and how viruses through uh, uh, spread you know with the trail and with missionaries and any human flow traffic in the 17 and 1800s to the west carry this you know um other weapons so mm. we're using that in that case the, the manipulation of the specific map, but also um, going back to the idea of how 
the matrix is something that is the foundation for pre-making and how dangerous it can be to manipulate it. We do it at, you know, at our school all the time, except mm -hmm. that we are, we hope that our results are, have no consequences, mm -hmm. negative consequences. It also raised some flags in, uh, there is a, uh, I can't remember his name, an Australian philosopher, um, I think in Canberra, I have to send you the link to his article, but he was always suspicious of pre-making because we can ma manipulate information mm. uh, as opposed to painting. You know, he was comparing sculpture painting as a true human expression, you know, like direct hand, uh, Leo Castelli, so to speak, you know, the God hands, you know, in doing painting. And I guess the counter point of that would be the devil with that, you know, chisel, you know, carving, you know, we're all with antithesis or something. But I really enjoy that, that uh, suspicion that pre-making races, you know, mm -hmm. whether we're telling all the truth, but I don't think we're in the business of, you know, telling the truth the same way Posada was you know defying the you know the word uh, what uh, well there wasn't word but it was what the dictator in Mexico um, mm -hmm. Porfirio Diaz okay so he was basically defying Porfirio Diaz there I'm sure he used a little bit of a propaganda in his prints Goya to define the you know the horrors of war so it was basically the I think he the philosopher was talking about how pre making has this other intent to fight for justice and therefore there's shouldn't be considered art. Right. Well it's a um it's because the ability to duplicate the original. You know, that being yeah. able to spread the message and and make it accessible to more where almost a print or a print series that's not unique that has multiples could travel out to the people where and whereas you have a painting, the people have to travel to a painting, you know, and, and as you currently are working though, people have to travel to you. I mean well outside yeah. of um social media and <laughs> all we do yeah. to get your work to yeah. everybody. Yeah. But people need to see them in person and um there is something about printmaking accessibility to people that is um, attractive to me but I, I hear what you're saying in that idea of propaganda it's that being able to spread this message and spread it faster that the I think the sad thing about printmaking is that it sometimes gets quickly relegated to a m machine made and this idea that the artist's hand isn't just as involved as on a painting is ridiculous if you're a printmaker and involved <laughs> in etching a plate or scratching the surface or pulling the print it's, it's, la it's uh, there's a lot of labor that surrounds the mark to create the that image that I find interesting um, so I'm, I'm looking at my other questions when you talk about Dwight and in, and inspiring you and and this latest body of work with the flow of water and, and your flow and you've referenced your history in Mexico. I know you've previously spoken about your identity as Mexican and your identity as American and this duality of negotiated identity. It's a, I call it Mexitopia. It's a <laughs> non-existent non entity because um, I'm totally happy with not being truly accepted as an American or nor a Mexican. Because when I go back home, they notice that I change. Mm. And that comes sometimes with the idea of language, you know, um, customs, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the fact that I'm not even recognized by my family, it's, it's something that I really enjoy. Or people here, hear people think that Mexican, which is fine because I'm Mexican. I was born in Mexico, but I'm in Mexico, I think I'm very American. Mm -hmm. And that the limbo, the idea of not belonging to a very specific place or a group of people really makes me happy because it gives me a lot of food for thought and not a lot of ideas to implement in my work. When you travel a lot, when you're speaking yeah. about your time in Japan and in China and having a, a broader worldview now, I think 
that's a privilege that a lot of artists get to have of being in more of an international place and drawing inspiration from who you were, who you are, and who you strive to be and sharing that journey sometimes visually. And I see you doing that in your work of this idea of, a, when I was thinking about it today, this idea of hidden language even. So if I came up to your piece and didn't know, I could see that there was lots of layers to it. I could see that there's a specific color palette and a recurring geom geometric theme. But I would need to speak with you. I am also a little disoriented if I hadn't spoken with you, um, being able to understand it fully. And yet a hidden language, I think it's, um, it's a prerogative that I want to keep somewhat private. Mm -hmm. I want to, I don't have a problem with people misreading my work because it's, a, it's not a book, it's not didactic. Mm -hmm. It's just a personal narrative, how I perceive and view the world. And then, you know, um, and I've been asked uh, for things to be more obvious, mm -hmm. understood, but I think as an artist, I don't have to do that. You know? Well, another way that I think about your work conceptually is that you started with a picture puzzle. So this idea of place or this concept of travel or a specific thought of colonialization, and you've taken it, and as we began with talking about is destroyed the layers. Or if we had a puzzle in front of us, just flip the table over and mix the puzzles up, flip some of them over so you can't see mm. the image and, re and recreate, and then start to just react to the pieces. And I see that, you know, that's, that's been something I've really enjoyed getting to know you and getting to learn more of your inspiration mm. points is when I come to the, an individual piece trying to see the, the flipped over piece, like, was that, oh, there I see it, it's a map, or that's a constellation, or there's an, an, a historical etching that might have been manipulated f a little bit further. I enjoy that. And there's part of me that wants to be the docent that just stands by your work <laughs> and tells everybody, did you look for this? Did you find this? And, um, but that's also one of the joys of going and seeing artwork and learning about an artist and their process is those are keys for people to find the little breadcrumbs to a, a deeper understanding. Right. I think the medium that I'm using, combination of drawing uh, with computer graphics, because I use routers, I use the lasers, I use the printing press heavily, and I go back and I paint on top of paper or wood blocks or, you know, you know, regular paintings. So all of these, I think, speak to contemporary times, you know, how we ad adopt technology and use it for different purposes. But uh, I really chose that medium because it lets me kind of express myself a little, mm -hmm. you know, when I have the uh, choice over colors and, you know, those have, have, to, have to be done by hand, but at times also allows me to translate an image with no manipulation going straight to, to the narrative of the piece mm -hmm. without my hand interfering. So for that reason, I really enjoy like doing a photo, photo of printing process and then let the photo interact with, you know, things that I've done by hand. So. I guess my source of inspiration for the end of my earlier period was um, Rauschenberg when he combined, you know, pop culture images of, you know, baseball players and irons and being combined in this, you know, higher form. But uh, by, I guess my focal point at this, at this point in time is to tell my story, combine the images that I see every day and in my head, I see, you know, you're basically looking at an x-ray of my brain of what my brain is seeing when you see these pieces. And that's exactly the same kind of conversation that I was having with Lisa Fannin from the Nelson Atkins when they asked to acquire the, the you know, to be done, to get uh, that in the permanent collection, those two pieces uh, about two years ago. And that was a show on spirituality. 
as well. Spirituality was part of it. Yeah. And then she saw some religious uh, references to mm -hmm. Durer and some of the Bibles that were used to by the missionaries to you know to convert Indians in, in mostly Latin America. So I use some of those as layers, and they're they're more pro prevalent at that point. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think when someone comes to see Geomatrix, they'll see works on paper, but they'll also see works that are not on paper. Right. So those are the paintings mo for the most part, mm -hmm. and they look like prints. Mm -hmm. But they, I, I'm painting on relief, which is the relief is something that I carve with a CNC. So it's everything is it's uh, my sketchbook, my photographs translated into a vector program and then carved out. So I'm not carving by hand. Uh, the machine is doing doing my sketch. So take it back and then paint on it, relief print it, and that's exactly what they will see. It's a, it's a hybrid. A hybrid. I, I like that. Um, so to end, you will be having an exhibition opening this Friday from 6 to 9 p.m., followed by an artist talk the next day, Saturday at noon, where everybody can come and hear you speak more about your work and ask questions. And I'm excited for the show. The work, I, I know that people are just going to have to take my word for it because this is all audio. It's gorgeous. And then if you, uh, your listeners want to follow me, I have an Instagram account as Grabador, G-R-A-B-A-D-U-R-1-2. And then locally uh, represented by Weinberger Fine Art, correct? Correct. And, and then, then, of course, here at Studios, Inc. And this is this show is probably 30% of things that I've done in the last two years here at uh, Studios, Inc. Mm -hmm. The other pieces are floating in, in other shows in, in the U.S. and Europe. Wonderful. Well, we're looking forward to it. Thank you for being my first guest at Conversations at I'm Studio Happy Z. to be back anytime. Yeah. Well, thanks, Thank you. Miguel. Thanks, Courtney. For more information on our resident artists, events, and exhibitions, please visit www.studiosinc.org. That's studiosinc.org. Thanks for listening. The music featured on our podcast is from artists Barry Anderson and Ricky Ullman of Lucite Plains.